Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for the Esoteric Moon Gathering, Activating Inner Trust and in Knowing. I hope with this summit that you will receive tools and practices to create more peace in your heart and your mind. I would like for people, especially those of us that might be highly sensitive and very empathic, can walk away with a better sense of how to take care of ourselves so that we can maintain our inner balance when outer influences might become upsetting. I would like for us to understand how we can get more quiet within ourselves internally, find those still points to touch base with, to get knowledge and wisdom from within so that we can learn to trust our internal guidance systems, especially as we learn to navigate this world, new world that we're living in that has changed so much in this year so far. So I, today I have Cater with me and I'm really excited to talk with him and get some knowledge and perspective and wisdom that he has so much of. Uh, Cater is an international ceremonialist and he's also a cowrie shell diviner. He's a healer and an intuitive He's a teacher of psychological and spiritual awareness, and he has over 35 years of professional experience. Over this time, he's developed an effective and unique approach to emotional and spiritual healing, vibrating together his depth of clinical knowledge of experiential psychotherapies with more nature-based indigenous wisdom teachings and healing methods from around the world. So, Cater, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so grateful to have you. Thank you, Dottie. It is really a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Oh, thank you. So, you mentioned that you wanted to start with a little bit of a ritual for us, which I'm really looking forward to, something that we can maybe take with us from here and um, use again in the future. Yes, I wanted to start with the invocation. Um, you know, listening to your your title um, of activating trust and wisdom, it only makes sense that we we lean into the sacred, um, that we uh, call upon something greater than our own personal discernment, um, something that might be called grace or go by many different names, um, to to offer us that trust. Uh, that grace. So I wanted to begin with a um, an invocation. And um, <clears throat> so I invite all our listeners at this point to close your eyes and imagine yourself, or another way of saying this, to send your spirit to one of your favorite places in nature. And to send your spirit to that place, your favorite place in nature, at sunrise on a spring morning. And we'll begin there, and I'll guide you through this invocation. But as you're standing there facing the sunrise, I invite you into this invocation. <clears throat> Creator, great spirit. With humble hearts, with open hearts, with grateful hearts, we call upon you this day to open the way for this conversation, to open the way for this global village that has come together at this time in this invocation. We welcome you to the circle with much gratitude. A hope. We call upon the ancient medicine ancestors, those medicine ancestors that have held circles and fires under moonlight through the night, passed down ancient rituals and ceremonies across generations and time. <clears throat> we thank you for the way in which you have held these ceremonies and rituals in your lives because they fed the heart of the people all people, human and non-human people. And we call upon you to this circle this day to awaken us within us, that bone memory where you live. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. 
now facing that rising sun that you're seeing there in this place in nature on this spring morning <clears throat> we, pop, we call upon the good medicine of the east of springtime of new beginnings of fresh new starts a place of seeing for the first time everything we call upon the medicine of eagle and condor and we thank you for teaching us how to see the big picture in our lives and also how to focus on the tiny details how to look with new eyes once again and letting go of the old stories that we may hold about ourselves or each other that no longer serve us those old stories that somehow trap us into ways of being and thinking and doing and so as we stand there in this new day in this sunrise we release those old stories and lean into the new dream, the new vision. And we call upon this good medicine of the East to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well, a hope. Quarter turn to the right, we face south. We face the warm summer breezes of south, the noonday sun the warmth of summer, the place of action, passion, and manifesting our vision, the place of courage, the courage to stand up and speak when that's what courage looks like, and the courage to sit down and be quiet when that's what courage looks like. We call upon innocence and trust and faith We call upon the energy of the warrior, that place where our words and our actions and our thoughts and our feelings are exactly the same, of impeccability and integrity. So much gratitude for the energy and the medicine of the South. We welcome you into this global village in this moment, into this circle, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. Uh -oh. And once again, we quarter turn in our place in nature to the right and face west. We face the setting sun, the rising moon at our backs, the setting sun looking forward. The season of autumn, you know, turning inward, sap receding on the vine, cooler nights of autumn bright colored leaves overhead and on the ground kind of autumn, the place of initiation and transformation, place of bear, owl and bat, and all those ones that teach us how to see in the dark, how to dream once again. That new moon, that dreaming time, that beginning time, the sacred element of water and healing and reconciliation. So we call upon all of this good medicine of the West to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -oh. Now quarter turn again to the right, we face north. And call upon the beautiful medicine of the north, all those beautiful ones of the north, the teachers of winter and the spirit of winter, place of stillness and dreaming and release and letting go. The sacred mountain, the elders, the storytellers, that place of abundance, the place of deep listening, the place where we surrender so deeply that spring simply shows up because we let go enough and for no other reason. The way that winter calls us into a deeper trust and faith and innocence that the light will come again. So we thank the elders of the North 
as grandmothers and grandfathers of the North. I would call the wisdom of the North and the spirit of winter into this global village, into this circle at this time, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. Uh -huh. Now we turn toward the center of the circle and we face skyward. Imagine yourself standing there in that place in nature on a dark, starry night beneath Grandmother Moon. And we send our spirit skyward and we call out to the heavens, to the sky nation. And we welcome our star brothers and sisters and others. We call upon Grandmother Moon and Grandfather Sun and we thank you, Grandmother Moon, for teaching us how to own those places that are in shadow and how to bring them into the light over and over again. How to move into the dark dreaming time and plant those seeds in the ground and bring them into the light. And Grandfather Son, we thank you for showing up every day and teaching us how to show up every day, even when it's challenging out there. How to fall down seven times and get up eight, always eight. And to our star sisters and brothers and others, with much gratitude for the way that you shine down your light upon us, reminding each of us down here that we too can shine as a beacon of light by the way that we live our lives so that you can see us from out there. With much gratitude, we welcome you to this global village, to this circle, and ask that you awaken within each one of us that stardust, that memory, that bone memory of belonging, I hope. And now leaning toward the earth, bowing down, knees on the ground, hands on the earth, belly on the earth, we acknowledge Pachimama, Spirit of Gaia. All things of the great below. This place that we all call home at this time, the belonging and connection and community. And we thank you for teaching, that, that teaching us that there are no borders of division between people, human and non-human people, between places of dwelling on this planet, that we have one home, and that we are part of one family. We also thank you for teaching us about balance and reminding us that we when we live out of balance. We thank you for those reminders that scarcity is an illusion only brought about by living out of balance with you. And we thank you for these callings to return to, to a balance, to see in ourselves in the circle of all things. The fiery cores and crystal caves and the ground beneath our feet, the soil and soul within our body. We call upon you to the Great Mother to awaken within each one of us that soil and soul that is also within our bodies. We thank you for bringing us into this place. And we ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. I hope. And now maybe imagining yourself staring into a fire, a friendly fire. The flames have died down, the coals are now hot and glowing and orange. And speaking into the fire, we call out to our ancestors. To our bright and shiny ancestors, those that lived well and died well, those seven generations behind us and beyond. And we thank you for your footprints and your heartbeats that are now buried in the ground. We thank you for your tears and your laughter that still echo on the wind. And we thank you for dreaming us into this place. And we call upon you, our ancient ancestors, to remind us once again of how to listen deeply to the moon, how to listen deeply to nature, 
how to learn to read the stars once again when the old maps that we have come to rely on no longer serve us. And we thank you to those seven generations behind us. And we call out to those seven generations and beyond in front of us. And we thank you for watching to see how we live our lives here so you will know what to do when you get here. We thank you for that accountability and we thank you for that trust. And may the way in which we live our lives be a blessing to you when you arrive here. And if there are ancestral helping spirits, all of you out there wish to acknowledge quietly by name, by face, take a moment and see them. Speak their name to yourself. And to all those ones whose names you do not know, be aware that they know you. You are their granddaughter, their grandson. With much gratitude, we call upon the ancestral realm. And may the good work we do here be a drink of sweet water to you on that side. And may the good work you do there assist us on this side. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Aho. Now to the spirits of the land that are around us, to the rivers that flow near us, to the spirit of the mountains that are close by, to the tall standing people, to the swimmers in the water and on the water, to the crawlers in the earth and on the earth, to the four-legged and the two-legged and the winged ones of these lands, to the plant medicine people of these lands, to the stone people of these lands around you. We thank you for all of this good medicine, for reminding us that we too belong in the same circle of life as you do, and helping us remember how to live there in a good way. With much gratitude, we welcome you to the circle and ask that you awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. I hope. And now to the great council that sits on the other side of this fire, stirring the coals and keeping them hot. We thank you for the way that you tend those coals on that side. We thank you for believing in us and standing by us. Even when we stumble and fall and have difficulty standing by each other and believing in ourselves. We thank you. And may we keep the fires burning on this side and tending those coals here. And may the way in which we live our lives be a blessing and an answer to the prayers of our descendants. Oh. So I welcome you now back to this circle that has grown much larger. And open your eyes and return here with us. And uh, hopefully, Dottie, the, the spirits will give us something adequate to say to all these people now that are listening. <laughs> we'll I see where this that. goes. <laughs> <laughs> that was really beautiful. Thank you, Cater. I can see myself returning to this a lot over and over again. That was really, really beautiful. Very grounding as well as um, connecting to mm -hmm the ancestral realm and uh, the animals and the trees. It was just, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, with this, you know, I think about the title of your, of your summit, about rituals of activating trust and how to deepen trust. And there's, there's that inner trust where we begin to uh, trust our own discernment. Um, and, uh, trust in our perceptions and the wisdom that we can gain and not give away our trust too quickly to, to another and then be surprised when they uh, don't carry it well. Um, but there's the maturity of trust and, and learning how to trust in our own discernment and also learning how to navigate uh, 
this road ahead of us with a, with a deeper trust and faith in something greater than ourselves. There's that kind of trust, um, that kind of faith, or um, what, I, what I call being broken open from the outside to grace. Um, and that which enables grace to enter our lives and, and uh, hold us, carry us, guide us. Um, I was thinking about the, these times that we're in and um, I was looking at this, this old, uh, not an old picture, I have a picture of myself and my partner. We were, we were out on this trail and we had stopped at this, this uh, one, one place on the trail and we're looking at this map. And I was reminded of that picture. It's like, it, it, there's a map that just it doesn't make sense anymore. And we're, we're staring at these maps that we've trusted and that have guided us. And it's like all of a sudden, these, these old maps don't work. And we find ourselves on this trail without a compass or a whistle or a useful map. And uh, I think in these times, we, we have to, to lean into the ancestors and learn to read the stars once again. Um, we have to navigate differently than we have before and, uh, and listen more deeply. Um, my teacher, Rockenberry, used to tell me uh, the, the three most important things he would say are pay attention. And that's it. And, would st and that's it. He would, I learned what he, it took 15 years to learn about what he meant. Um, he wasn't really meaning about the redundancy of attention, meaning pay attention three times. He's really speaking of an old Toltec teaching that speaks of levels of attention. That there's kind of this ordinary level of attention that we give our lives and navigate through through our lives. We might call consensus reality or um, convenient reality. Um, and it's necessary. You know, we have to stop at stop stop signs and you know get through get through this physical physical life. And then there's the second level of attention, which is more about noticing that we're separate from the first, where we begin to track. We develop a witness self that begins to notice and not just uh, believe something because we heard it or, believe, or we read it, um, or, it because, or it comes across with the loudest, most uh, charismatic expression, makes it somehow more believable or more true. <laughs> Um, so we begin to develop a witness self that tracks the first one. And then there's this third level of attention um, that is this other connection to something to something greater um, that guides us. And so when I think about, I give some thought thinking about this idea of, of trust and navigating the territory of the unknowable. Um, when you asked me to come up with the title, I was, I was thinking about that and I thought, um, receiving grace and navigating the territory of the unknowable. That sounds like a, figuring out how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cause That's it's, practice. It, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to know the things, to know about the things we don't know. It's like, well, I don't know this or I don't know that. Um, but who helps us know about the things we don't know we don't know? Um, that's a whole, uh, cosmos of, of information that's un, unknowable and that's where the mystery that's where faith i think that's where trust ultimately ends up being offered to some place there um, and i've noticed during these times people that that have a uh, a sacred map a map that that helps them lean into something of of uh of the sacred um, they seem to be more at peace, more at ease, more uh, in a way to navigate without, without a, a fear of taking over. And when you mention a sacred map, is that something that we develop internally? Is that something that we can find externally or a little bit of both? How would you recommend yeah. finding your sacred map? <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so I would say it's, it's, uh, it's all of those things. Um, I think for, for some people, they may have been given a sacred map. Um, 
in, in some form of a, a spiritual tradition. Um, and at some point in their holding of that sacred map, though, it become it can become more personal. It can become not something that they they took on, but something they develop personal relationship with. Um, and then it, it becomes uh, something of a sacred map, not just uh, something somebody gave you. Um, when there's personal relationship and understanding beyond. Uh, what we were given. Um, and then there's, there's uh, the sacred maps of the world and of nature that, you know, for those that didn't get handed one of these sacred traditions, uh, maybe they'll learn the sacred map through just contact with nature and um, learning to listen to, to and, and read, read things through nature. Um, so that could serve as a sacred map. Um, what makes something sacred? One of my, um, a, a long time ago, I studied with Stephen Foster and Meredith Little at the School of Lost Borders. And I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, I think it was. And I was talking with Stephen. He said, you know, if you go in, into nature and sit and eliminate all distractions and notice the details of everything around you and I would add this part, let the details of everything around you notice you. That place will become sacred simply because you have noticed each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so this way of, it, it's, um, you know, in the old stories of uh, the King, the Arthurian stories and the um, stories of the search for the Holy Grail and the story of Percival, and uh, he, he stumbled into what they call the Grail Castle. And he didn't have the right question. He was too naive, too young to know where he was. And he didn't know what to do there, what question to ask the, the wounded king to help the king heal, meaning to help the realm heal. And then he finds himself outside the castle. Uh, and he spends the next 20 or 30 years looking for it again. And the only direction he has is it's, well, it's just around the corner. Um, and so it's a reference to the map is a, is a perspective in, in relationship um, to the moment um, that opens that, uh, that map up. So it can be, you know, looking at the stars, whether we, we have truly learned to navigate the stars as the old sailors did. Um, all the old journeyers across the landscape, or um, in that way of deep listening um, uh, to that stillness, to that to nature in that way. Um, so, as my work as a as a ceremonial wilderness guide, that's the essence of of finding that new map is is preparing people to go into the natural world. Um, with minimal provisions uh, and in the old way of many of the old sacred maps and traditions, fasting, solitude, and exposure to the, the natural world and elements. Those, those three, uh, three things were present in, in uh, most all of the sacred traditions in some form as a way to connect with um, or what I would call make yourself available to grace. Um, since grace is not something we can choreograph into our lives, mm -hmm. it only seems to come when we uh, feel broken open from the outside by challenge. Um, not because we have done some clever ritual to choreograph its entrance into our life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think that's, that's something else. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's that birthing place uh, of trust. When we say, how do you activate trust in these times? Um, is to really, to activate an openness um, that, that welcomes or, or that invites or makes yourself available to the sacred, makes yourself available to grace to come in. Um, since it's not something we can, uh, 
in an organized way choreograph our way into. Um, Do you have tips to, to open ourselves to that grace? Uh, um, yeah, there are lots of uh, ways of, first, I, I guess uh, an initial thing would be find a, a place you can be still and quiet and then notice first what occupies your mind when your mind is giving quiet. Uh, as they say, do, do you, uh, in the sweet territory of silence, do you like the company you keep? Um, and what happens there in your mind? Um, one of my teachings is that the, the, the job of your mind is not to constantly be running the show or running at all. The job of your mind is to record information and give it back to you when you need it to strategize a plan of action for the road ahead um, or to, to discern um, what's in the present moment in, in great detail. Um, other than those things, the mind really shouldn't be running at all. What should be there is your awareness, um, your attention to the moment. Um, and so the, the gatekeeper, what I call gatekeepers to our awareness to the moment are those things that prevent us from being present to the moment. And it's usually all the things that spin in our heads when we get quiet. Um, the thing is, if you, if you can go into nature or even sit at your, sit with a candle, uh, if you're in a city or go to a park, um, but to sit there long enough um, until, and start noticing the details of everything in your immediate space. Um, and, and noticing that these things are noticing you, that the, the, uh, the mockingbird or the woodpecker that just flew across your field of vision isn't simply just passing through on the way to somewhere else far away. It actually lives around here. <laughs> um, particularly if you see it in the morning or evening, uh, it's because it lives close by and it notices you and you notice it. And, and the moment you have in that encounter it opens the door of the, the sacred. Um, good way to do it is uh, to do, a, do what it might be called to do a medicine walk where you can, uh, it, whether you have an hour or whether you have a whole day, but to go to a, a natural place and do what I call a threshold ceremony, which would be a way of marking that you're stepping into um, stepping into the sacred it might be simply to to make a circle on the ground or put a stick across the ground and and when you step across it or step through it you step through with a a prayer of gratitude to to your understanding of the sacred is you know please show me what i'm most now ready to see that would be a very simple one or you may carry a specific question about something um, but you carry that question or that openness and, uh, and that's the invocation at the beginning. You step across the threshold and you're into the natural. And now you start paying attention. You walk with that second level of attention that we talked about. Um, and you notice everything, every encounter, um, what comes up to meet your question. Um, and uh, take your journal. And, and you spend time. Again, you could do this in an hour. You could do it in a, uh, from sunrise to sunset. Uh, it could be a much longer period. Uh, a more or, uh, or a, a rite of passage might be for several days where you're guided and it's, there's space held for you to go out for you know, three or four days and nights into this space. Um, but I tell people, don't worry. Spirit doesn't need a whole lot of time, just needs your availability. So if you have an hour to do this, it'll still work. <laughs> um, so you step across that threshold and you open. You open to receive and notice everything that's noticing you, uh, that's reflecting something about the question you carry. And you let yourself just intuitively uh, walk with that and notice what comes up. Um, and when we notice what comes up, that would be things in the environment around us as far as animals and maybe like wind patterns or in our thoughts. What do you recommend? Yeah, you can notice what, uh, what comes up, maybe what thoughts come up to meet it. 
okay. you know you uh that you you turn a certain direction and the sunlight hits your face and you feel warmth and you're you're there just in the experience of feeling warmth mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden a thought pops in to interrupt it and say like, hmm well, that was interesting that thought took me right out of my experience mm -hmm. um or maybe the thought welcomes it you know um, so you can notice the inner and outer experience. Um, when you carry a particular question, you let the inner and outer experience be that which is coming to uh, receive and respond to the question. Okay. Um, I did this a couple of weeks ago when, and during this time that we're in, at this moment of this interview, where we're kind of in this uh, forced, sequestered solitude, um, I took a walk out on out on this land, um, out in nature, and I did this. I did a sunrise to sunset, and uh, said a prayer, asked for guidance, saying, "What is it that I most need to be aware of during this time?" And so I went walking, and I was guided to, up to this stone, and I sat on this stone, and I had brought this journal with me that uh, I hadn't opened in probably several years and I only written on the first page and I opened to the first page having not seen it in several years and it just was a question I didn't know it was going to be there and it says what do you want your life to look like and uh, and so I sat with that and then I walked down to the, the this uh, uh, um, above the this trail above the river and I saw these deer come up the bank and so I squatted low so they couldn't see me or smell me. And they walked right up behind me and I kind of turned my head and I saw them maybe 20 feet just kind of pass. They didn't seem to notice me. And six of them walked by and the last deer stopped and it turned its head and it looked right at me and I looked right at it. And in that moment, there was an opening. Like there was a, a mutual acknowledgement. Um, the moment it was all of a sudden became sacred in a different way. Mm -hmm. So we just held each other, other's gaze for a moment. And then it turned its head and quietly followed the others. But there, like in that, um, something opened. Um, and then later on, on this hike, um, I found this bear skull. And so at the end of the day, I sat with bear and, and I sat with deer and ask for, you know, what, it, what are the teachings that, you know, bear and deer might have to offer. And, and uh, as a heartfully held attention with deer again and those eyes, um, compassion, like I says, this is a time where compassion is needed. Um, gentleness with yourself and others. Um, and when I turn my attention toward bear, said this is an important time for dreaming and and dreaming in uh, what what world is to come, what what is it, what life is to come, you know, be intentional with our dreaming so we create uh, something that's intentional um, and not habitual. Um, so that was a uh, an example of, of of a medicine walk for a day. Again, I, you can do this in an hour, and you may and you may notice a. A butterfly or a, something that, that just speaks to you in a certain way or speaks to your question um, and journal about it and see it's a way to to, to realize that there's um, when we talk about trust and faith and grace and how to navigate um, you know the, the the ones that I have noticed that navigate well well um, you know, I would say metaphorically have learned to navigate by the stars again. They have leaned into some old way of something, something outside themselves by whatever name they give it. As Joseph Campbell said, the greatest things in the universe cannot be named. And of course, the second greatest things are all the names we give the first one. <laughs> um, so this, uh, and working with the moon is your is your the invitation of 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 uh, moon wisdom. My work the moon comes up a lot in the 
the, the ritual prescriptions that I recommend for people. Um, we're on the eve. Yeah, what's that? Would you share some of those with us? Um, yeah. So the um, so I know we're on the eve of a new moon coming up in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the uh, ritual prescriptions I uh, offer for people um, for deepening um, a sense of something greater than themselves is to uh, to call in their um, healthy, we'll say their healthy ancestors is kind of one way to say it. But the way I reference those that lived well and died well in your lineage. Um, so we're talking about your, your, your four main lineage lines, adopted or not adopted, doesn't matter. Um, but essentially, uh, grandmothers and grandfathers, um, these ancestors. So to, um, to, to call in some ancestral support. Um, and when I say those that lived well and died well, the particular ones, not, not old Uncle Bob that you might not have liked when he was here, and why would you want to invite him into your living room now? Um, but to have this sense of calling in the sacred. Um, so this is a ritual I recommend people do on the new moon. Um, the new moon for, for me is in the old calendar, it was the dark time that marked the beginning. In the old calendar, the beginning, as, as some of us know, began at the end of, of October, the beginning of November, what, what in some traditions would be called Samhain, or the Day of the Dead. And it was this entering into the darkest time of year, this, this passage into the dark, that things began in the dark. They didn't begin with sunrise, they didn't begin with the light. That's kind of a new idea. They actually began in the dark. That's the dreaming. Um, and so this entering into the new moon energy, the, you know, it is like with planting, we think of, well, this is the time you put down the seeds, literally and, and uh, symbolically and metaphorically, we plant the seeds of, of the new in the dark. And so the new moon energy can hold a lot of that um, way of being in relationship to dreaming in the new. So this ritual would involve um, getting uh, an unpolished rose quartz crystal. Um, uh, uh, we'll say a, a strand of uh, red yarn, 13 feet long. For me, 13 has an association to the moon, has an association to the new moon specifically. Um, the 13th moon is that dark moon. Um, and for listeners, this, uh, when we say new moon, we're talking about the dark phase. There's three dark nights. That's the new, not the crescent. <laughs> That's when we're moving into the other period, but the dark time. So uh, this 13 feet long of red yarn, this rose quartz crystal, unpolished, um, and a ring simple ring we'll call it your your um, ancestor ring doesn't have to literally be an ancestor ring just one that kind of speaks to you of relationship to your to your ancient ancestors those that lived well and died well um, those that you may not know but know you <clears throat> you take this uh, to a small running stream of water at the beginning of the ritual you call in uh, your understanding of the sacred in whatever form that is for you. And included in that, you include your ancestral helping spirits specifically. Um, you put the, tie one end of the yarn to the, to the rose quartz stone, unpolished, uh, because this stone represents uh, the bright and shiny realm the love and the wisdom of the ancestor realm in your lineage. Um, and as stones often represent the, the holders of, and transponders and transceivers of story and information, um, also understanding stone, stone people is that. 
but specifically the connection to your helping ancestors. You tie the, tie the yarn around that on one end. Uh, the 13 feet of, of yarn travels downstream. And on the other end, you tie your ring. So when I say ancestor ring, it could be not literally a ring that came from your ancestor line, but one that just speaks to you of that. Maybe somebody gives it to you. Maybe you see it in a store. It's like, oh, that's, that's the one. You'll just know. Tie it on there. Also take with you uh, an offering of milk and honey. Um, so as the, uh, once you move into the night, um, you uh, do your invocation. Um, you call in your helping ancestors to help heal uh, the, the divisions of trouble and turmoil that live between where they are and where you are all that in between mm -hmm. and you pour the milk and the honey over the stone and it travels downstream across the the yarn which is your bloodline bringing sweetness and healing across the line down to the ring which is your relationship to your helping spirits and you leave it out there overnight um, if you can you can leave it out there over all three dark nights um, but at least one night of the new moon. Um, whether you're camping or returning, um, but you go back at sunrise, um, either the next sunrise, if that's what you can do, or three, if you can leave it for three, um, and you retrieve the ring and the stone, and the yarn itself goes in the fire. You can just burn it in the candle or fire, that's, that's offered up. And then you wear the ring. And you, somewhere on your person, whether it's on your finger, on your neck, around your neck, around your ankle, wherever, you wear it on you to begin to infuse this uh, relationship at this time of the new moon with your ancestral helping spirits. Begin to keep a journal, track your dreams, um, and you keep this ring on your person um, until at least for one full cycle, until the, the moon reaches full moon. Um, you might continue to wear it after that, um, but at least until then. And, and if you're not wearing the ring on, on you, if you take it off at some point after that, you would place it with the stone. And so, um, and then the stone becomes a beginning place to have um, an ancestor shrine or altar uh, where you can begin to connect with and tap into the support of your grandmothers and your ancient grandmothers and grandfathers. Um, so again, it's it's working with the the energy of the moon during this during that new moon time, that dreaming time, that beginning time, uh, to heal. It's a ritual of of healing, healing the line. Um, now, one could say you could do this for all four lines. You have four stones, four threads, different nights. Um, but just as a beginning, um, if you're not in a place where you have access to nature um, and you simply want to do this in your apartment in the city or somewhere, then I would use a, um, a candle to, to, as a, a fire, a way to open the door of communication, a bowl of water, um, some uh, an offering of milk and honey, the uh, strand of yarn, maybe you shorten it to three feet, the rose quartz stone, <clears throat> and um, place the, the the stone and uh, with the yarn wrapped around it in the bowl of water. And um, and then let the yarn come out to the you know out of there to the ring. If you can put it all in water somehow, you can do that. Um, and then the invocation that you do at the beginning, then the milk and honey is poured over the stone, and is left overnight. And so you could, it's a way to simplify the ritual if you don't have access to the to the outdoors or a small stream. Um, Thank you for that. But to do that, you know, on a on a new moon night be a suggestion i love that thank you you're welcome you're welcome thank you for bringing in the um 
the city version too. <laughs> yes, it's you know, there's many of us that aren't aren't uh, have access to the net to nature very easily. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, so in the invocation, the beautiful invocation you did for us in the beginning, you talked about our shadow energy. Mm -hmm. Is there, do you, do you have ways or recommendations of how to work with that shadow energy in a gentle way so that we can maybe get a better sense of our, our inner trust and in knowing? Mm -hmm. well, so it's, again, use, using, uh, acknowledging Grandmother Moon as a teacher of how to bring that which is in shadow into light okay. over and over and over again. <clears throat> and, um, and so maybe we set ourselves on a 28 day process of doing some shadow work. If we say, uh, if we define shadow as those things that we would have, feel challenged with, whether they're patterns of behavior we have or experiences we've had or thoughts or emotions or whatever those things are that we would rather not uh, disclose in the light, but, need that, but yet they, they need light. Um, if we just define that that is shadow. Um, then it's uh, another word that I would have for these could be gatekeepers, meaning that these are the things, these are the gatekeepers that stand at the gate between where we've been and where we're headed. These old patterns, these old ways of being. Um, and another way of thinking about it that's even more gentle is usually these old ways of being, these things that are in shadow can be old ways of loving that we've learned that just don't work anymore. Um, but we learned uh, in, some, in, in some context at some time that being in connection with another meant we took on these ways of believing or doing or thinking or feeling um, so in that context, we took them out on out of love, no matter what they were. We took them on out of that place. So I call them old ways of loving that just don't work. Um, so these are the gatekeepers. When I say we sit with those gatekeepers um, and we get to know, we, you know, we don't demonize them uh, because they, they served some purpose. And, and we can't really release something unless we receive the teaching that it had to offer. Um, otherwise, we're just, you know, you can throw something down on the trail, but you're going to pick it up again if you don't really know why you carried it to begin with. <laughs> um, so receiving, what is the teaching that this, this, uh, this shadow aspect has for me? And how can I use that teaching in my life moving forward? And how can I also uh, get to a place of releasing it with blessing and with gratitude, saying, you know, thank you. Um, remember a person that was... Uh, kicking the habit of, of nicotine and uh, we were sitting together uh, outside this house and they were smoking they were looking at the cigarette almost contemplatively and uh, and they said you know I'm about ready to put this one down but first I have to say thank you because you got me through some really difficult times um, but I don't but you, uh, I'm in a different place now um, and so there's that way of acknowledging um, that things in shadow are also part of us and have served some role. Um, and once we learn that, then we can, we can, we can set them down and, and step, step beyond them. Um, so that's a, a different way of holding, you know, a thing in shadow. And, and here's another concept um, for those that think about shadow. If I say, I want you to think about something you have never shared with anybody ever, think of that as shadow. And then say, for how many of you right now, you thought about something really horrible or shaming or uncomfortable to talk about? That would probably be no, most people. But in reality, your genius, your beauty, your gift, have you ever acknowledged that? Do you keep that in shadow? Because that too needs to be, you need to, you need to, as I say, you need to cast a bigger shadow. <laughs> you need to stand in your beauty and your genius and your medicine and, and let it be seen. 
and don't shrink back because it makes other people uncomfortable with how they're living their lives, um, which is often a reason why we do that, yeah. you know, because then they get uncomfortable with how they're living their lives and they might want to stop us or, or shame us or, or ignore us. Mm -hmm. um, so that, uh, so things that we hold in shadow can also be the, that which makes us smile and we're afraid to smile. <laughs> I love that. It's beautiful perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cater. You've shared so many really wonderful, wise, and um, practical things for us today that I'm so grateful to you for that. There's so many things to take away from this and uh, yeah, quite well. feel and keep walking our best path. So thank you. Yeah, it's been an honor. Always, always good to sit with you in, in circle like this, Dottie. Oh, thank you, Cater. Likewise. <laughs> very grateful to you. Have a beautiful day. Stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Go well. Everybody for watching.